Carnival really is a closed shop, you know, and somehow we got in through pop art, like somehow Hobby got in through uh, another another area, you know, we, we had a different aesthetic. Hobby, you were the um, original spirit here at Luna Park. You came up from Adelaide and you started this place here, what, in 35, and you've seen a whole development of Luna Park over the years. That so is, that, yeah, that is correct, that is so. Ted Hopkins was one of the most beautiful men that you ever met in your life. He was really Luna Park. That guy lived there. He, he was there day and night. And David Atkins was the business side of Ted and David, the Luna Park show. And when I went over there as a sub-teenager, I would be greeted effusively in the office and a roll of tickets pulled off and I was invited to come back when I'd used all of them up, which I did. Ted Hopkins was an exceptional man. He came from um, an electrical uh, engineering background because of necessity in the Depression and things. He went from the, from the straight world into the carnival world, I think. He was such a sort of um, native sort of genius in a way. And I think it was the force of his personality behind it all that, that brought the whole place into focus and he had a great team which we just met the last sort of members of, you know, who, who'd worked with him and, and Tony Maloney's one. Tim was very particular, like if he had a light bulb out, he used to come in and see more than 10 light bulbs out, he'd have a go at you. He'd say, you know, I'll see 10 light bulbs out of you, but you know, he wasn't happy. You'd sweep the park together, everybody would sweep up and you had a crew that, you don't know what you did, a fit electrician, you just swept the park and then, you, and then you went and did your job. So it was just, everybody just got on so well. Um, building Luna Park was nothing. Building the bridge was everything. When they finished the bridge, where Luna Park is now, where the pool is now, is just a forest of weeds. All of a sudden, the workmen turned up, and overnight it was finished. It was very quick. Those other workers were, in fact, the blokes that had built the park in the 30s that re-erected it. And some of them had, in fact, worked on the Harbour Bridge and stayed on site. Quite a few people came from uh, Glenelg in South Australia. I knew them all very well. Uh, we had the hotel next door. Several were you know, artists and uh, carpenters and what else have you. Dedicated those people there, it wasn't, it wasn't a job, that was just their life, everyone. It was their complete life. We're talking about a generation of workers that simply doesn't exist now. You know, those, like I say, the Gladstone bag and the hat and the, you know, it's hard to believe people really did that. Um, and they, there was a really definite sort of attitude to work with them. A lot of the old blokes had a quiet appreciation of things but knew that you just didn't go against the grain. Nobody ever hardly left. So it was closed for three months of the year and then you always used to wait to see. If you went on the permanent crew, you always used to wait and rush out the letterbox to make sure you got your start next time. So, uh, but no, nobody ever left. It was just, you know, here forever. Arthur Barton was born in South Australia in 1887 and he'd moved to Sydney with his family by the turn of the 20th century. And he joins up for the First World War in 1916. He goes over as a machine gunner and is wounded in France. His wounds give him an opportunity to be repatriated to, to the UK and it's there in 1919, just after the war, that he studies at the London School of Art. 
Arthur, Arthur started at the very beginning at, at Luna Park. He wasn't the first artist there. Rupert Brown was the man responsible for the design of the, um, the first face and I suspect many of the other elements within the park. But Arthur's the resident artist very soon after that. And he's there at the very beginning with those classic showmen, you know, Ted, Ted Hopkins and um, David Atkins. Ted didn't interfere too much with Arthur, Arthur and his own race. Just one of the crew. Yeah, there's no status. Unassuming sort of a guy, very quiet, kept to himself, always busy. We all just come and work, clocked on, and everybody just disappeared and went and did their jobs. You often see Arthur and Fred Swatley walking around together, and they both had white overalls on. They both, most of the time, always wore hats, and you just always notice Arthur he used to always have his uh, cigarette hanging out of a holder, which was quite unusual that most painters didn't have. They always looked dapper, had a little hat on, and they always looked, they were, they were special. They worked with Arthur and Coney Island, they did the work in there, redid it. Uh, they made the clown heads and uh, they did the uh, merry-go-round, they repaired all that. And uh, in the river caves, they did the beautiful job of the river caves, it was uh, all done. Uh, my father, uh, Fred Swikley, he worked at Lunar Park for 16 years, he never missed a night and he had the band down there. A floating palais that was um, actually went on the water, it moved around with the water and that was, that was um, just attached to Luna Park. There's a ramp going down to the floating palais and you could see out the sides at night. In 1940s and the 50s, there wasn't much to do in Australia. Tourists would come from everywhere. Where would they go? Loon Park. Why? It was so cheap and so much fun. New Year's Eve in the Depression era was nothing. And all of a sudden, Loon Park came. And New Year's Eve was just, uh, all of Sydney was there. There must have been a million people there. Practically every Friday night, when it was around about 16 to about I was still going out with him when I was 18. We'd get a tram down to Luna Park. Friday night was Luna Park's night. They used to have balls that you could throw at clowns, you know, and all sorts of things and win prizes. We had three trains running on the Big Dinner, which were 72 people screaming. That's what we used to do on the big Saturday nights. And we'd have 8,000 people here on a Saturday. You had to close the gates heaps of times, there's just too many people. The first go I had on the Big Dipper, I thought, never again. I thought I was going to come out of it. Every hour you had to walk the Big Dip because of the movement of wooden roller coasters. We used to love going to Luna Park. You know, you'd, you'd queue up in this huge queue outside the, um, the swimming baths down there. And uh, then they'd open the gates and, of course, everyone would run towards the Big Dipper. That was the biggest attraction of all. Saturday mornings, I think it was probably the aeroplane jelly. Kids used to go down there, there'd be thousands of them coming in the gate. We used to fight like mad to get on the saucer because you could only stay on the saucer if you got on first and got onto the centre of it. So we knew that, you know what I mean, and there'd be a battle to get there and John and I'd argue with each other who, who was going to get there first, do you know what I mean? I liked them all, but I suppose the um, whirler, I think, was the best. You know, we, they spun it around, you, you spin off. I was very good, I, I could stay on forever. Oh, steepest slippery dip in Coney Island. Oh yes, of course you did. <laughs> oh yes, yes, you, you graduated to that. You graduated to that. You started off with the smaller ones and then you got game enough to go. You know what I mean? Yes, you were virtually dared by each other. Well, I'm going. Well, if you're going, I'm going. You know what I mean? Yes. I don't know whether you know this or not, but when you used to go to Coney Island, I hope you were dressed properly because you'd walk through a little quarter and the wind would blow your dress up. And one night a girl came through and she had nothing underneath. <laughs> I have vivid memories of Coney Island, of it being chock-a-block with marvellous um, enjoyment going on. The Big Dipper and Coney Island were always my favourites because Coney Island was the thing you had to work for your pleasure. You had to climb up the steps and then take the slide or everything you had to do, which is Marvellous the way it's um, virtually the same today.
but he was so accomplished um, across a, a range of um, mediums and he really does deserve to be put in the context of international fairground art alongside the names of R.J. Lakin and Co. and Fred Fowle, all the great artists in, in Britain and also the American artists as well. Oh, oh we loved his work, loved it, yeah. uh, still do, you know. Well, it's got a lovely humour in it and it's a sort of a good nature. Most of it, he didn't paint too many dark images. I think Gary Shedd first put me in touch with Arthur Barton. He used to, uh, uh, he said, uh, oh, he, I think he'd been working at Luna Park. I think. And he said, oh, he's a pioneer Australian expressionist, you know. And I, I sort of took him seriously, you know. He sort of 20 years later, he told me he was joking, you know. <laughs> if you look at Coney Island, there was a, an identical one in, in, in America at the Coney Island in New York. There was an identical in, inside pleasure place with the slides and the barrels and things like that. So really, there was nothing original about transplanting that. It's when you put Arthur's artwork with it, and that's why he's so special. And that's why I guess we came to really appreciate him so much. Uh, Luna Park had Aussie flavour. It didn't have the American flavour at all. That's why I liked it, because that was the Aussie flavour. So this one had a charm, and, it had, uh, and a lot of that was to do with Arthur's painting and his sculptural abilities and, um, and you know, the, the leadership of Ted, I think, and the crowd who were working there with him. You didn't go in and say, wow, look at those paintings. You just went in and, and the atmosphere was made by them. Do you know what I mean? It was a wonderful synthesis. He was the number one artist. He only just did the main work and had a couple of other artists in the park that did it as well. But he was the main one that did the theming and the concept and that. Uh, Arthur probably also sort of came in during the Depression. I mean, he had his own sign writing business, Arthur Barton, and our signs are neck twisters. The first time I saw Arthur, I'd gone to the Easter show. Well, I was a boy, you know. And there's these two men in white overalls on top of this scaffold, and big sheets of paper, and they were painting. And they'd rip down the paper and throw it down, and they'd start another one. So they were doing big paintings very fast. And, uh, and, and I learned a lot from how they broke up letters. He was a, a very gentle gentleman. Elma was in her late 40s, I think, when she first met Arthur. They wanted to get married, and they were obviously very much in love, but Elma wasn't prepared to get married while her parents were still alive because she was looking after them. She agreed to marry him before her parents died. They would meet at lunchtime in, at North Sydney and go to the church at North Sydney and get married. The first two times she stood him up. Uh, but the third time she did, she turned up and they got married. And she just continued to see Arthur, but without her parents knowing. And in the mornings when she was on her way to work, he used to meet her at the end of the street with a glass of orange juice with an egg stirred into it because it, life for her was so stressful and he was trying to look after her. I thought, I, I think he was a simple person. Just a simple guy. I don't know, it's sort of like um, simple art, isn't it, really? Simple, simple humour. I mean, what, what, what value would you put on those paintings, you know? I guess they're just priceless, you know? I've tried to do some facsimiles of Arthur's work, but you can see uh, what a wonderful free hand he had when he did these, these paintings. I really uh, think he's... Uh, what is it, that awful word, quintessentially Australian, cartoon tradition of his art. I've always been attracted to that. And I've always loved humorous uh, um, Heath Robinson cards, where I think Arthur was heavily influenced by Heath Robinson. Bruce Band's father uh, was a cartoonist who was serving in the trenches on the, on the Western Front. And he drew cartoons, quite dark, but very, very humorous cartoons of his experiences in the trenches. And one of the most famous ones was called The Better Old. Well, in 1917, shortly after he's um, wounded, Arthur does not a cartoon, but a serious sketch 
of a field hospital at a town called St. Omer, which is in Belgium, I understand, and it's called The Better Ole. So it's a clear reference to Ben's father's cartoon of, I think, 1915, 1916. Barton would have been very aware of, of Ben's father's art, and you can see elements of that creeping into his later cartoon style. Yeah, he painted on canvas. There's a canvas there. And that was used in the back of a game. He would have painted on everything available on the timber of, of a wall or whatever they left ready for him to paint. I think he painted up under the cliff at the entrance, to the right of the entrance, where Ashley is now. I think that's where he was. He could paint, you know, he could do portraits, great uh, comic portraits. You couldn't buy a, a colour to match Arthur's. You had to mix your colours from the primaries. It changed my life, in fact. I, I started using primaries only even in my own work, because that's all he would have had through, through the 30s and 40s. He used enamel paint, which was probably pretty new at the time, and he used it very well, you know, and he could paint very fast. Well, yeah, it was just like seaside stuff, you know, Australian, Australian Brighton Pier type seaside stuff. It was terrific and funny and had, I think, really, he, uh, coloured the feeling of the whole park. Arthur Barton is politically incorrect best. North Sydney Olympic Pool opened. We used to go to North Sydney because it was so nice to walk across the bridge and go, go to the pool, spend the day in the pool, and then uh, go to uh, Luna Park afterwards and have a look. Rupert Brown set up um, many of the rides and the, the interiors of the rides when Luna Park is pretty well bought up um, in its entirety in crates from Glenelg. Each ride had its a thing called a bridge where they, um, they built this wonderful architecture around it and it was quite unique and quite special. Down the front you had the, uh, called the octopus, which is an old octopus car that used to go out, you know, actually one of them came off one time and floated in the water. But, um, they went out, he had the big spider, you know, the big the whole facade, and the facade would probably be 10 metres high. It had an atmosphere of its own. The river caves, they were another favourite, where, um, what do they say, they had the largest deposits of pasta of Paris in the southern hemisphere. And, and that would have been, it was simple fun, the boat came downhill as a gravity run and uh, they were, used to visit about nine countries, Africa, South Pole, Japan, Outback Australia. So that was a gorgeous thing. Through the 30s, 40s and 50s, Australia was a pretty moralistic society. There was early closing with pubs, there was no trading on Sundays, and yet here was Luna Park where you could go and almost do whatever you want. I mean, clearly there are boundaries there as well. Um, but you could go and maybe take your girlfriend, and there were particularly at night lots of places where there were shadows. The river cars, I'll never forget that. I was in it with George, you know, having a kiss and a love in the dark, and, uh, uh, and then when we came through the jungle part, the boat got stuck on the side and I said, oh, I'll push us off and I hopped out, pushed us off and George and the boat disappeared in the wild bee yonder and I'm standing in the jungle. I was a bit frightened because I didn't know what I was standing on. I thought it might have been just chicken wire with a bit of cement over it and, uh, and every boat that came along had a comedian in it. The fellows would say, Jane! Tarzan dump you. Jane, you're looking for Tarzan. And they all said the same thing. And they all laughed like mad, real comedians. 
<laughs> no. <laughs> I thought it was fun. I was frightened and funny at the same time. The place that the, the amusement park occupies within culture more broadly is somewhere that allows people to engage in non-respectable behaviour. So their dresses go up round their ears as they go down the slide. Well, that's OK at Luna Park. Clearly, it's not OK in the street. When Ted sold out, he sold it to Leon Fink and um, Nathan Spatling, of he uh, wanted to pull it down, I guess, and uh, wasn't able to. So um, they employed Martin to, um, to come in and, and uh, touch it up. He took me out on the harbour and said, what do you think of that? And I said, well, what do I think of what? And he said, well, you know. I said, well, it's Lunar Park. What do you mean, what do I think of it? It's Lunar Park. And he said, well, what do you think of it? Uh, as a positioner, and I think he probably had some uh, idea as a convention centre or something like that. We worked with Harry Seidler to prepare a master plan for not just this site, but this site and the railway yards right round into Lavender Bay. And we presented that one that went down like a lead balloon. It was going to be developed into a, a trade centre, you know, and then that fell through because public land had to be, foreshore land had to be public use. Seidler was a great supporter of Luna Park. He changed a little bit as he got older, but at that time he was a great supporter of it and thought that its, its retention... He was, wasn't the least bit disappointed that his master plan for the area was rejected and that Luna Park was going to stay. Once he was sort of stuck with Luna Park, he thought, well, I'll, I'll make the most of it that I can. And it was an opportunity for him to give artists who... Um, traditionally find it hard to make a living a job. Margaret and I went across by ferry and uh, we were both very excited about the prospects of bringing it back to life. And uh, we already knew young Martin and Richard and Peter. It was very, very clear very quickly that they were going to be the team, whether I liked it or not. They almost came in the door and told me that they were going to be the uh, people who would make Luna Park come alive again. Yeah, it was really because of um, pop art, I suppose, that I was considered a suitable designer, you know. And then I received a sort of a letter or a postcard, why don't you come and paint the face of Luna Park? Or, and uh, it was a good offer and so... I... New work was much more difficult to get right than the restoration of the old work. The old work, the decision, the artfulness was already done. I got a letter from Martin saying, to, you know, we were going to, to practice drawing cutlasses and pieces of eight and, um, because we were going to do Pirate Pete Sea Battle, which was a new game at Luna Park. And you'll get paid and why not, he said. So um, that was my, my introduction to Luna Park through, through Mart, really. And uh, so we worked on that for six months and it only lasted a day because the balls were too um, powerful. And the, they started firing the, um, the compressed air balls at the, uh, the whole thing all just blew up. Well, <laughs> it kept breaking <laughs> from the guns being too strong for the artwork. Leon said, you need a job, come over to the park. So he'd already had uh, Michael Lunig and Bruce Petty wandering about thinking, you know, what they could do. Gary Shebb was there. Gary painted all the scenes on the merry-go-round around the top, you know, each country that you visit. As artists, we fell in love with it as a <laughs> and were given the job of restoring it to a certain extent, you know. The Opera House is going to bring a lot of attention to Sydney Harbour and there was a response all around to doing it up. They didn't ask us to restore Arthur's work, they just wanted us to do colour schemes and, you know, uh, repair it a bit. That's what they asked us to do. We just couldn't feel the place sort of properly, you know. It was it came up with all sorts of different designs. We, we had a studio under Coney Island, and one day there was this very sprightly old guy turned up in his boat called Daydream 2, and it was Hoppy, Ted Hopkins, you know. And as soon as we sort of met Hoppy and we sort of started to understand what the park was about, perhaps, you know. It was all, it, it, it was an ongoing, it was a very flowing, thing because no matter what we did start on, Martin would be sitting at home worrying about the next stage and the next stage and not sleeping. 
and dropping notes under my door with urgent advices as to what really needs to be achieved next and making new running orders every couple of months. We were all young and genuine and enthusiastic. My feeling too is that it was a bit of a race to save things, that it was a matter of finding things and collecting them and saving them. It was going out of focus when we went there and we tried to sort of pull it back in a way and bring the tradition back to it. But then, you know, you realise that the Arthur Bartons were so special. So we used to find new ones all over the place, underneath cupboards and, you know, it was very exciting. We, we felt that if it was um, restored, because it was probably the last lunar park that was built in the world, and so it was the most intact. If it was restored as it was, it was just a, going to be a, it would be a guaranteed world success. When people sort of saw that we loved Arthur, they, they sort of bought out a few that they knew had been stashed away and things. So we started to do an in-depth archaeological search of lunar park. At that time, in September 74, much of it literally was like in a time war. Part of it is about restoration, respectful restoration, and part of it is about creating new representations that encapsulate the same sense of humour and pleasure for young people. But, but we were approaching it as artists, which is, you know, doesn't always run with business, you know. Never does, usually. <laughs> Sometimes it does, you know, but... Uh... Ted Hopkins built the Mighty Mouse for us on the slab, the raised slab, and um, he said, right, the directors are going for the first ride. He said, there's only one thing I want to warn you about. When I say duck, you duck. And I said, why is that? Oh, he said, we've still got a few bits of scaffolding holding it together. So off we went, and it was an outrageous ride, and he called out, duck, and we ducked. <laughs> <laughs> often there's the feeling like uh, the latest thing's the best, but often, you know, like the Big Dipper or whatever, you know, they'd reach their zenith, that was the best. You're never going to get a better. Martin asked me to repair a head and I didn't want to fiddle with someone else's work. You know, the head, I think, thought the head should stay. So what I ended up doing is completely peeling back the two figures and recreating them as two other characters, Larry and Lizzie Luna. The problem with ours work too is we put Estopola over a lot of it and of course that, you can hardly see it now. That was a terrible thing to do. We thought Estopola would, you know, preserve it, but of course Estopola goes, goes black, you know goes brown to black, you know, over the years, you know. So we did all sorts of silly things like painting the background cream, did remember? We, yeah. Oh, did we? Yeah, we did we or ever. was it before? I don't know, it was that's dirty. A, that's, a, that's original. But you can, oh, you, can, you can see around here, it's been cut in around there. See? See? Yes, yeah. yeah. Leon asked, quite simply asked, he said, would you like to do the carousel? And we thought the, the brief was for to work out a colour scheme and have the whole thing done in 10 weeks. There were two blokes, there's Harold Wilkinson who was from England and Sel Carr. And Sel was 67 and Harold was in his 70s and they were wood carvers and they were doing a beautiful job but it was taking too long and it ended up a bloke came in and had this thing where you'd, he'd dip all the horses into a caustic soda bath. The merry-go-round was ruined, that sort of got um you know, the horses were dipped in caustic soda and that got inside them and then it started erupting and, oh no, Jesus, we were just hopeless. <laughs> Never mind. There would be very sometimes vigorous debate about which way a certain part of the park or artwork should be taken and how it should be treated.
huge space. It's still, people, it's the biggest face in Australia, you know. It's the biggest expression of a face, yeah. I think Martin's face was sketched a couple of dozen times before Martin got close to being happy with it. The first one that he came up with made the face the unhappiest place in the world and terribly threatening. And of course the one that he finished up that we did together was probably the happiest one that uh, was ever made. The struggle to achieve a happy face which Arthur Barton managed, you see, so he was an amazing sculptor to have achieved that and also to have... And I think that was Hoppy's face in a strange way. Old King Cole was the sort of thing that they liked, you know. So this is pretty much... Um, reversion to the face which uh, Arthur Barton designed, which was, uh, you know, the face which I painted over in 1973 with uh, Tim Lewis and uh, Richard Liney and others, you know, we, we uh, redid it. Mm. Quite a big job up there on the ladders and things. <laughs> Faces like, you know, it used to have uh, uh, flickering neon eyes. It was the biggest neon, the you know, Temple of Moloch. Looking at the city, it was going to take over. That's how I saw it. <laughs> really, maybe fun fairs are sort of the, the disguise that Molochian temples used through the centuries, you know, to keep existing. Uh, and so dressed up as fun, but they weren't. Bottom line, they weren't fun at all, you know. Sort of uh, a man grabbed my hand very firmly, and being young, you didn't know what to do. And the place was packed with people. And uh, he said, would you like to do them? And I suddenly realised I had to get away from it. I didn't know how. But the uh, ghost houses, I knew it backwards. I said, I'd like to go to the ghost house, because as soon as we got in there, I took off. And uh, <coughs> I was out in 10 minutes flat, whereas I suppose he was 10, 15 minutes before he got out. And I watched him when I got out where he left, immediately left the park. Yes, there are lots of ghosts in here. You'll shiver and quake in the ghost lane. <laughs> it was the saddest moment of my life. I looked out the window and there was the ghost train ablaze. I'll never forget that, never in all my life. It's an absolute night of tragedy here at the Berliner Park in North Sydney. I sat with a woman most... should never happen because, you know, when you're running a right, amusement business is a bit unique that you've got to know how to run it right. Um, those are right, and where you had ghost trains at the showground, you always had somebody inside. You never ran a ghost train, you had somebody inside. It was just a no-no. And that particular night, they didn't have anybody inside. But everyone, after what happened to those kids in the middle of the year of the child, and especially the, the man's name being John God's son, and uh, being in a full moon, death striking, where man has mocked death, etc. Et so there's a big lesson to be learned from it. I hope I learned my lesson from it. Terrible, terrible thing. And I think Luna Park really died that night. It was a duty, a neglect of care that the fire happened, but he was only on a week-to-week -week lease. So the government was culpable too, because it wouldn't give him a proper lease to spend the money. I walked up to Neville and uh, Jill and said, Neville, what the devil are you doing punishing me about not renewing the lease? He said, while well, my bum points to the ground, you and your partner won't get that lease. So unfortunately, not only the creative side, but I regret to say that the, the, uh, even the maintenance side had to slow down. But amusement parks, that's their nature to burn down, unfortunately, if you trace the history of them. You know, they take you close to, to um, peril, and then finally there is peril, you know. Number 37, Noah's Ark, It was a very sad day, you know. It was raining and you know, Hugo asked, oh, was the auctioneer, who I knew from when I was a boy. 
uh, good auction here. Disgraceful, it was sort of like selling things they hadn't even brought. They just bought the lease of Luna Park and these, all these treasures just happened to be there. And of course when auction day came they, they sold everything. Posters and carvings and Buddha and all sorts of, that was one of the saddest things, seeing Buddha being trussed up on the back of a truck, you know, being taken out. Um, a Thai Buddha, marble Thai Buddha. They were selling the rides, they were selling the barrels of fun and they were selling the joy wheel and they were selling the turkey trot. They couldn't sell the slides because they'd have to be torn out and ruined, you know. And they just wanted them out, out of the place. Anything that was, they could, they'd sell. They weren't allowed to sell the murals, so, you know, that were around the walls. left of David Jones Locker, the sailor. Went to the auction sale, whenever it was. Was it 81 or 80? It's 81, I think. And they were auctioning off everything. I wanted a bit of memorabilia. I was never a huge fan of fun parks and things, but I thought it was a bit of Sydney. Um, by the end of the auction sale, things, people had got a bit tired and they weren't bidding so much. So I was able to get this and it cost me $75. Martin had lost in, you know, interest in physically uh, restoring Coney Island, but he had brought the joy wheel, barrels of fun, and the turkey trot. He brought them at the auction. They were sold, and his mum gave him $7,000, and he brought the whole three. So otherwise they would have gone to the tip. So you can thank Martin, really, that Coney Island exists in, in its present form. So, and then he sort of um, sold them back to the Lunar Park Trust when the time came. You know? And he stored a lot of the Arthur Barton artworks at, at his house, and uh, we were able to bring them back too. We realised that the <coughs> people who were bidding against us, we were bidding to keep them there. The people who were bidding against us were the people who were, said they were trying to save the place, but it really were the owners of it who were, didn't want us to buy it. You know. And King O bought the river caves. Were they furious? I tell you what, they were furious. Uh, so we realised that they wanted to get rid of the place. You know. This is a particular item, the river caves, that can be fixed and made safe and uh, it would just be criminal to bulldoze it, criminal. I owned the River Caves for three hours. I bought them at the auction for $10. I bought them at two o'clock and I had till five o'clock to remove them from the site. So unfortunately, uh, um, I lost my $10 and lost the River Caves. I was here with Ted and sitting in the crowd with Ted and he was, had tears coming down his eyes. It was too sad for him. I picked him up and brought him down and uh, it was too emotional for him. <laughs> The kids seem to want it saved, you know. Well, um, we'd always, the artists, the artists who worked here uh, were always friends of Luna Park, but officially we formed after the fire because we thought this was uh, going to be the end of the place. <laughs> A lot of work was done on the conservation of Coney Island in the 1990s when there were plans to reopen the park. Peter Kingston was very much involved in that, as was Ashley Taylor. That reincarnation only lasted about a year because there were many complaints about the noise of the Big Dipper. The work that went on in Coney Island in the 1990s forms the basis of the original part of the park that still survives. Coney Island is um, a national treasure, so everything in there belongs to the state. We've collected a lot of what was around the park that was Arthur's is all in here now, so it's kind of, this is the real museum of his work. 
I love to think that little kids coming now are inspired or even just notice the, that it's painted and not photographically presented for them, you know, out of a computer. Now, this crowd here, as far as I'm concerned, they're perfect. I think it's great, yes, and uh, I'd hate to see it leave. Oh, good, I always love Coney Island, you know, it's a... But, but I look at it with a bit of concern because I think it needs a, a permanent curator. I feel it's a pretty important part of my... The luck of being here is I should look after the heritage element and maintain it as much as I can, you know. Oh, it was a very special place, very special place in those days. And that's why it's so disheartening today that there's no river caves, there's no ghost train, there's no mirror maze, no uh, David Jones locker. Um, anyway, uh, time's changed. I mean, people come here because trying to remember their past and you know, going to Coney Island, which is unique, and uh, enjoying it that way. You'd be, you'd be hard pressed to find a single piece of paint that we'd done. But we were more interested in preserving Arthur's work, you see. I've been told to have my own era, so I kind of put some, something of mine into it whenever I can. I just let the designs come out and using both Arthur's influence and my own experience, they kind of suit. What, what I, would have, I, I would have loved to have done is stayed there and just work, created characters, you know, like Arthur Barton did, that sort of stuff. Yeah, no, it was a very cosmic place, Luna Park, I, I think, you know, myself. I mean, when it was quiet, you know, the whole place would sort of, or as, a, as an artistic place, you sort of see it. For me, it was, uh, uh, you know, trying to keep the truth alive in a way, and, uh, and this was a way of doing it, you know, through the art, I suppose. Someone who swept right off your heels. Goody, goody. You met someone and I know how it feels. Goody, goody. You gave them your heart to like I gave mine to you. You broke it in little pieces and now how do you do? You lie awake just singing the blues all night. Goody, goody. You think that love's a battle of dynamite. Hooray and hallelujah. You had it coming to you. Goody, goody for him. Goody, goody for me. I hope you're satisfied the rascals you. It's a good day. Singing a song and it's a good day for moving along. Yes, it's a good day. How can anything go wrong? A good day from morning till night. 